If, you're, if you think you really have it and enough people tell you you have it, then keep going. Don't stop. Fight for it. But if it's your mother that's saying, he's the best, you're amazing, and you're not really, go to school. Michael Buble is a true shining star. Coming from a humble home in Vancouver, Michael has gone on to conquer stages all around the world. Incredible voice, that incredible charisma, and some incredible records, and ultimately, live performances. Michael Bublé owns and lives for the stage. Except for you, crazy woman. Ah. No, okay, no, shit, I'm not doing anything, let's just talk. Ah. I know you're a mom. I'm a singer. I show up and do this. Uh, While well, you Americans are sitting getting fat, us Canadians are ready to take over. <laughs> you know it! But each time he signed an autograph or posed for a photo, it looked like it was the first time because he was smiling and chatty and asking questions about the fan. You're facing eviction, Ah, uh, yeah, you saved me with the signature. Oh, dude, I'm so happy. Now he can stay. Can you come live with me if you want? Michael Bublé loves his fans like no other artist I've ever seen. Oh, I love everyone too. I don't know. Stop loving me. Multi talented, multi award winner, and multi platinum artist, Bublé has everything going for him. You know what's weird is I buy my own shit on eBay, right? <laughs> <laughs> Romantic jazz star has acquired a global fan base of millions. Michael introduced his future wife to the world in the music video for I Just Haven't Met You Yet from the Crazy Love album in 2009. It was a massive hit record. Michael Bublé has established himself as the modern-day king of swing. His soulful appeal compares to the way that Frank Sinatra introduced jazz to many a household for the first time. And Bublé's passion for music translates not only into huge record sales, but also brings him a wealth of admirers all around the world. I stopped playing and all I wanted to do since I was a little boy was this, and I started working in the nightclubs when I was about 16. And I, I struggled for 10 years, and I got signed at 26, and uh, five, five years later now, I'm uh, 22 years old, I think so it worked out. Michael Bublé had a rather unusual childhood. He was born in Canada to a father who was a salmon fisherman and was rarely at home. So he spent most of his time with his mother, his two sisters, and his grandfather, who had a very, very marked influence on his life, his career, and his childhood. Michael Bublé is one of the most successful recording artists of the 21st century. But as a youngster, his first and strongest passion was ice hockey. Michael Bublé obviously has a real passion for ice hockey. He always did as a child. He played the sport. Even now, he actually owns a professional ice hockey team. But I think it's probably quite lucky for the world of music and definitely for himself as well that he never actually put that passion for ice hockey ahead of singing. Michael has always said if he'd been any good at ice hockey, he would have a very different career than he does right now. He was passionate about the sport, wanted nothing more than to be a professional ice hockey player. And he and his grandfather used to go to ice hockey matches all the time. Of course, ice hockey being very popular in Canada. It's amazing to think that Michael Bublé wanted to be and could have been a professional ice hockey player. I mean, he was that good and he was that passionate about the sport. But ice hockey's loss is the world of music's gain because I think if we'd lost him to ice hockey, uh, the world would have missed out on that incredible voice, that incredible charisma, and some incredible records, and ultimately, live performances. Michael Bublé owns and lives for the stage. I can't ever imagine him in the pads, on the ice, doing the ice hockey thing, because his voice is too good. When Michael was just 13, he started singing along with Bing Crosby's White Christmas in the car on a family trip. And it was then that his family discovered his amazing voice. So Michael Bublé was only 13 when his family 
first noticed his incredible singing talent. He was singing a Bing Crosby song in a car. And I think, obviously, for them, they would have thought, you know, that, that this was something special and incredible, and I guess that had to be harnessed. So when his family or his parents first discovered that he could sing, it must have been a bit of a shock. You know, he's this tiny little little thing from Canada, and out comes this huge, massive, uh, booming voice. And I believe that his uh, music teacher at school also said something, was really excited because he was singing fantastically or standing out in, in the choir. His family was astounded at the voice in the car. It was like, who is this little guy? Well, they had no idea that he had so much talent. And almost immediately from that point on at 13, his grandfather passionately believed that Michael was going to be a big music star and, and really did everything he could to make that possible. But the thing is, you never know. At 13, a lot of people have a strong voice, a lot of boys in particular do, but then you've got to go through potentially the period of the voice breaking and all of that sort of thing. So I definitely think no one at 13 could have had any idea quite what this was going to lead on to for his career. Since Michael Bublé's voice was discovered through singing White Christmas, it was obvious that Bing Crosby was going to be extremely influential on Michael and his career. So Bing Crosby's White Christmas album, obviously one of the world's jazz classics. So perhaps it's not a surprise quite how much of an influence it was for Michael. He would obviously listen to it every Christmas with his family. And I think his goal really, his absolute career goal, would be to try and be a modern day Bing Crosby. Throughout Michael's younger years, there were many people who helped guide and advise him. But it was Grandpa Buble who helped shape the future of his young grandson. Michael has a lot of Italian blood, perhaps accounting for some of his dashing, sexy good looks. But his uh, maternal grandfather was Italian. He was from a little town in Italy, and he was a plumber. And once he understood Michael's innate ability and talent as a singer, he then took it upon himself to do whatever he could to make Michael a star. Initially, he paid for singing lessons for Michael, but then he took it even farther and started offering his services as a plumber to anyone and everyone in return for time for Michael on stage. Or well, the fact that his granddad touted out his services for free to try and get his grandson a leg up and a foot in the door in the music industry shows A, how close the family obviously are, and B, how much they believed in Michael and his talent. The one person in Michael Bublé's life who can take credit for really shaping him uh, into the star that he is today is his grandfather, who is basically responsible for not only funding his early sort of interest in getting him into clubs and stage performances, but also is the man that played him all these incredible records, Bing Crosby, the Mills Brothers, Dean Martin, and some of the real great vocalists of all time. It was his grandfather who shared that passion, who also shared that, I guess, that real commitment to pushing Michael to become a stage performer. Without his grandfather, I don't think Michael Bublé would be where he is today. This was a man who was, perhaps you'd say, a stage mother, and in any case, it was his grandfather who really supported, encouraged, and pushed him to follow that dream. As a teenager trying to make his way in the music industry, Michael entered and won a local talent competition. However, it was later discovered that Michael was in fact underage, and as a result, he was disqualified from the competition. When Michael was 17, his grandfather really encouraged and pushed him to enter a uh, talent competition in Canada. Unfortunately for them, he was not of the minimum age of 18, he was 17. However, he entered and proceeded to win. At, at the same time, he was instantly disqualified when organizers realized he in fact was not 18. However, I think in the end it probably worked out best for him because the organiser of the talent competition actually signed him, organised a local tour around the clubs. And I think you often find that that sort of adversity in your career is actually something that's going to spur you on and want to achieve success even more. Perhaps with a feeling of guilt or maybe she was just blown away by his talent, one of the producers of the show, Beverly Delich, said to him, look, 
um, I believe in you, let me put you in a Canadian youth competition where you are eligible to perform and let's see what you can do. And he won that one too. And she went on to manage him, I think for the first seven years of his career, was hugely instrumental in helping him turn into the artist that he became. Well, what's it like playing bigger idea. venues now, man? Like uh, I make more money. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from his grandfather, Michael's family thought he would go on to be a successful backup singer for other musicians. Little did they know that Michael would go on to become the headline act. It's interesting because Michael's family always actually thought maybe he would end up one day as a big backing singer working for superstars in Las Vegas. Obviously, you know, that's a, that's a great job for a professional clubbing singer. However, I can only imagine what his family must feel now that he's the main act with his own backing singers. Obviously that would be an immense sense of pride and probably surprise as well because, you know, there are so many successful, talented singers in the world. Only a few of them actually do get to break out and achieve such success that they can actually headline a show in a place like Vegas. The whole world is aware of Michael Bublé's musical talent. But during his early singing career, the Canadian star also tried his hand in acting. Perhaps born of an innate desire to perform, Michael started looking for opportunities to get up and do his thing. Now, he was performing all over the place, you know, cruise ships and conventions and really any opportunity. Even he was a children's performer at one time called Mickey Bubbles. He was really looking for opportunities to practice what he wanted to do. And that included acting. He was cast as Elvis Presley, which is sort of interesting, in a musical production called Red River. Now, this was very significant for him for two reasons. One was he met the woman he would be with for the next 10 years, an actress called Debbie Timmis, who ended up helping him learn the dance routines and they became very good friends and struck up a relationship that would last a decade. Um, additionally, I think playing Elvis early on in his career had a real influence. If you look at his style even today, the way he dances and grabs the mic and he has kind of this swagger on stage, which does remind a lot of people of Elvis Presley himself. I think that performance still resonates with some of his performances today. I much prefer and give credit to Michael Bublé as a performer, as a singer, but you have to acknowledge the fact that he has done his fair share of screen acting. I mean, some of his fans may not be aware that, yes, he began his career uh, doing bit parts for films and television in Canada, eventually appearing in things like The X-Files in the late 1990s as a, I think he was a submarine officer, but uncredited. And then, of course, he got some major film roles when he appeared in the Gwyneth Paltrow film, Duets. I mean, he still harbors ambition to appear in movies. His idols managed to do that. Dean Martin and Frank Sinatra, of course, owned the silver screen. But I think the real skill and his real strength is performing to an audience. But it'll be interesting to see. Maybe in the next five years, he'll be up there winning Oscars. At a time when Michael's music and acting career seemed to be going nowhere fast, he considered quitting the entertainment industry in order to go back home to Vancouver to become a journalist. When Michael was 25, he really seriously considered giving up the dream. He had been really out there trying. He and Bev Delich had been working extraordinarily hard to get his name uh, to become a household name. He'd put together some independent albums which hadn't really gone anywhere. He was performing all over the place, you know, cruise ships and conventions and birthday parties and anything he could do to practice but he still hadn't become the kind of celebrity or star or talent that he wanted to be. At that time, apparently he was uh, thinking about giving it all up and going back to Vancouver and becoming, like me, a journalist. So um, I'd have had a rival on a personal note, I'd have had a rival in the newspaper uh, world, but on a global scale, the world would be, you know, devoid of a fantastic songwriter and um, a man responsible for about 5,000 million uh, wedding proposals, I imagine. And he was ready to give up, you know. Bear in mind, this is a guy since from the age of 14, 15, had really been out there trying, and now he's 25 and he thinks, okay, it's not gonna happen for me. So he moved back home and he was gonna become a journalist, he was gonna find another trade, he was gonna find something else to do. And he really believed at that point it was over. Michael Bublé's decision to pursue his music career was about to pay off. With small-time recognition already in the bag in his hometown, 
The real breakthrough for Bublé's career came when he was spotted by a former associate of the Canadian Prime Minister, Michael McSweeney, while performing at a business party. So Michael's back in Canada, kind of discouraged, thinking about giving up on the whole singing thing. And in the meantime, he makes a very important and powerful friend. This was a guy called Michael McSweeney, who was a, an aide to the former Prime Minister of Canada, Brian Mulroney. Now McSweeney thought Michael was fantastic, loved his album, and kept giving it out to his friends, one of whom was Mulroney who also agreed, had a good voice, and thought, you know what, I'll get this guy to sing at my daughter's wedding. High-profile weddings attract high-profile names, and Bubli had the good fortune of being introduced to the multi-Grammy award-winning producer and Warner Brothers Records label executive, David Foster. Now, as you can imagine, as a former prime minister, he had very powerful and important guests at his daughter's wedding, one of whom was the multi-platinum award-winning uh, producer, David Foster, who happened to be a guest at the wedding and heard Michael perform. Apparently, his version of Mac the Knife was incredible. It brought the house down and everyone just was awed. And who is this guy? was kind of the buzzword at the, at the woman's wedding reception. So uh, David Foster took Michael aside and said, look, I don't know how to market you. At this time, you know, jazz is not really something that is big in, in America, in the world. However, I really like your sound, I like your style. So come out to LA with your agent and let's see what we can do. Foster knew immediately that he had come face to face with a winning formula. Upon discovering more about Bublé's trademark voice, good looks and musical know-how, he signed Bublé to his record company, 143 Records. And in 2001, the two began working on Bublé's first major label release. It seemed that all of Michael Bublé's hard work and dedication to his music career was about to pay off. In 2003, Michael Bublé's self-titled first major album was released, and it was a worldwide success. Eventually, going multi-platinum in many countries and reaching the top 10 in the UK, his homeland Canada, and hitting number one in Australia. Well, Michael's first album was released simply called Michael Bublé, and I think the reason they titled it that way is they were really just trying to introduce him to the world. It's interesting because um, at one point, the, the Today Show in America did a, um, did a show where they talked about Michael and they did an ad kind of for his album, and they just kept saying, it's Bublé, because they really, people had no idea how to pronounce his name, they didn't know who he was, and I think it was actually very clever because by making the album title his own name and by kind of emphasizing, you know, how to pronounce it and everything, he became very quickly a name that people were familiar with and understood. Shortly after the album's release, Bublé embarked on a worldwide tour. The tour included Singapore, South Africa, the Philippines, the UK, Canada, South America, and eventually the United States. The tour was hugely successful, with Bublé managing to successfully sell out arenas all over the world. At 28 years of age, Bublé had officially arrived on the international music scene. His self-titled album included singles such as How Can You Mend a Broken Heart, a Bee Gees cover, which was released as the album's first single. The single was released in the US and managed to reach the top 30 of the Billboard Hot 100. The album's second single, a cover of George Michael's Kissing a Fool, was released on May 8, 2003. And many critics have stated that this was the standout track of the album. But please don't take my heart. You are fine. I'm never gonna be your star. The song shows Bublé's amazing vocal range and was often his encore at many of his shows in 2003. Strange that I was wrong enough to think you'd love me too. You must have been kissing before. 
I said you must have been a kissing of Michael Bublé's self-titled album was eventually certified four times platinum in Canada and two times platinum in the UK. And Bublé went on to win the Best New Talent Award at the Juno Awards in 2004 and was nominated for Album of the Year. Well, in 2004, Michael was uh, nominated and won Best New Artist of the Year at the Juno Awards. Now, some people might not be, know what those are, but this is the Canadian version of the Grammys. It's a hugely significant honor to win Best Newcomer. And this kind of announced to the world that, um, at least in Canada, really, he was a household name. And I think you can't underestimate the effect that these kinds of things have in the rest of the world, because even though um, Americans may not be that up to speed with the Junos, uh, the press and the publicity that he would have gotten from that would have certainly helped him when it came to getting singles released and videos made uh, in America as well. After experiencing huge success with the release of his self-titled album, Michael Bublé was now the name on everyone's lips. His fan base was growing by the millions and his life was now under the microscope like never before. Thanks to his success, Michael and his girlfriend Debbie Timmis were now one of Hollywood's hottest couples. Michael and Debbie started dating in 1996 after starring in the musical Red Rock Diner. Fast forward to 2004 and they were being photographed on a daily basis and featured in showbiz magazines all over the world. Michael and Debbie's relationship was incredibly serious. I mean, it was the real deal in her eyes. And I guess at the time in his eyes as well. I mean, these guys got engaged and around that time she was an essential force in Michael's life. After the success of his self-titled debut album, Bublé was back in the studio to record his second studio album, It's Time. The album was released on February 15, 2005, again by 143 Records. The album reached number one in Canada, Italy and Japan. It managed to reach number two in Australia and number seven on the Billboard 200 in the US. The album reached the top 10 in the United Kingdom, Switzerland, Norway, Austria, and Sweden. The album spent 104 weeks on the Billboard Top Jazz Chart, including a record-breaking 78 weeks in the number one spot. It's Time was Billboard's top jazz album in both 2005 and 2006. To date, the album has sold over 6 million units worldwide. After its release, It's Time received positive reviews from contemporary music critics, with many of them commending the use of Bublé's vocal ability. The album went on to become a commercial success, topping charts all around the world. The Record Industry Association of America certified it three times platinum after selling three million copies in the U.S. Michael released his second studio album, It's Time, in 2005. This was really what cemented him, I think, as an international success. And I think at this point, he was becoming someone that everybody knew and liked. Uh, one of the songs on this album that I, I sort of can always hear in my mind is Save the Last Dance for Me. Everybody knows that tune. Most people have heard that song, liked that song, and that was one of the big hits on this album. The album went on to experience huge success and will always be remembered for its lead single, Home. I'm fine, baby, how are you? Well, I would say them, but I know that it's just not enough. My words were cold and flat, and you deserve more. Home was released as the album's lead single on March 28, 2005. The single peaked at 31 in the UK Singles Chart.
the single managed to reach 72 on the Billboard Top 100, whilst topping the adult contemporary chart in the US. Home was also a top 40 hit in Australia, Austria, and Switzerland. Another aeroplane, another sunny place. I'm lucky, I know, but I want to go home. I got to go home. The beautiful song Home, which has actually been um, uh, re envisioned and recreated by several artists since Michael because it's been such a popular tune, which he co wrote. Now, he wrote it at the time about his love, Debbie Timmis, who he was still dating at that time, absolutely missing her while he was on the road promoting his album, and wrote the song for her. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful love song. The only regret he probably has is that he announced to the world it was about Debbie. So now that he's married, every time he sings it in the concert, that's maybe slightly awkward. But nonetheless, it's a beautiful, sentimental song, and it shows the kind of romantic side that he very clearly has. Another winter day has come and gone away in either Paris or Rome, and I want to go home. Let me go home. The song was met with positive reviews from music critics, with Aaron Latham of All Music describing the song favorably. Latham stated that the song was a positive step forward for Buble, also adding that the success of this ballad provides yet another direction that Michael Buble can explore and expand upon. It'll all be all right. I'll be home tonight. I'm coming back home. Being a self-confessed romantic, Michael Bublé dedicated the single to his fiancée, Debbie Timmis. The music video, directed by Noble Jones, has an astonishing 25 million hits on YouTube. He even dedicated um, the song Home to her on the It's Time album, and in fact, she uh, helped with the writing of several of the songs on that album. At this point in his career, Michael Bublé was riding high. He had released two multi-platinum albums, and was adored by fans all around the world. But things were about to get tougher for Buble. In mid-2005, it was announced that Michael's engagement to Debbie Timmis had been broken off. The two had been dating for almost a decade, but after nine long years together, they decided to split up. In 2005, Michael's personal life took a big hit. He and Debbie broke up. Now this was a very significant relationship. He'd been with her for a decade, and this was someone who knew him way before he became famous. And I think for famous people, there's always um, a special place in their heart for people that they knew loved them before they became successful and famous. And it was a very uh, sad and difficult breakup. I think we saw a new chapter in Michael's life, but we saw him go on to do bigger and better things in his career. But it was very clear to everyone involved, including Debbie and Michael, that it wasn't meant to be. They fell in love far too young. After ending his nine-year relationship with Debbie Timmis, it didn't take Michael Bublé long to get back in the dating game. News was soon spreading all around Hollywood that Michael's breakup with Debbie had coincided with the emergence of a new relationship, a romance with British actress Emily Blunt. Right around the time Michael and Debbie split, he met the actress Emily Blunt. They met in Australia, as you do. They were both on the same show. I think it was an award show, and they were backstage, and they were chatting. Now, Michael says he had no idea who Emily was. He thought she was a producer on the show, but he thought she was gorgeous, and they started a conversation. Well, very shortly after that, or just before that, he and Debbie announced they had broken up, and he was absolutely besotted with Emily, and he would be uh, for the immediate future. After the two went public with their relationship, they were now a hot couple in Hollywood. The two were photographed hanging out in Hollywood and were snapped at many red carpet events. How are you doing today? I'm really happy. I'm very proud of my, proud of my girlfriend, uh, Emily Blunt, who uh, 
who's one of my who's you know one of my favorite actresses and just happens to be my girlfriend and I'm uh, I'm thrilled for her. I'm really proud of her tonight. When Michael Bublé was dating Emily Blunt, it was quite the hot topic in show business circles. I mean, they were photographed everywhere. They went to red carpet premieres together. They did the party scene together. They really were the full-on couple. And he was besotted with her. I know people that were close to Michael and his entourage that said, yeah, it was the real deal. He was totally besotted with her. And equally her with him. With newfound love in his life, it was now time for Michael to get back in the studio. In 2007, he released Call Me Irresponsible. In 2007, Michael released his third studio album, Call Me Irresponsible. Now, at the time, he had a lot of buzz kind of already building about him internationally, but he'd never made the top 10 in the US, apart from the jazz charts. With this album, he shot straight to number two. So you can see the momentum was really building. Also on this album is that song, Everything. You're a falling star. You're the getaway car. You're the line in the sand when I go too far. You're the swimming pool on an August day. Buble wrote the lyrics of everything for his girlfriend, Emily Blunt. He later explained, I wrote the song about the great happiness of real love. But at the same time, I was making a statement about the world. We're living in really crazy times. And I wanted to say that no matter what's happening, this person in my life is what really makes it worthwhile. That I'm your man And I get to kiss your baby Just because I can Whatever comes our way I will see it through Unlike Buble's other work, this song strays away from being band-orientated and carries a more adult contemporary sound, carrying some elements of pop and rock. And through these crazy Every line, your every word, your everything. It was written about Emily Blunt, and if you listen to the words, it's absolutely incredibly romantic, basically saying that she's, you know, she's everything. She's the line in every song, she's everything he wants to see, she's um, the meaning of everything, she is everything in his life. And in fact, Emily even participated in the album singing backup vocals on a different song. So the pair was very, very much together. Emily was a huge part of his inspiration and the album, which sold two million copies in the US alone, did incredibly well. The video was posted on YouTube, where to date it has received over 43 million hits. Famous Bono impersonator Pavel Safara makes a cameo appearance in the video. The single went on to be extremely successful, reaching the top 10 in many singles charts around the world. Call Me Irresponsible was another hugely successful album for Buble. The lead single, Everything, peaked at 46 on the US Hot 100. It also debuted at number three on the Canadian Airplay charts and currently holds the record for highest debut ever on that chart. To promote the album, Michael Bublé appeared on season six of American Idol in April of 2007 and sang the album's title track, Call Me Irresponsible. Bublé successfully managed to wow the audience as he gave a memorable performance. After his performance on American Idol, Call Me Irresponsible began to rise in the charts. In the US, the album debuted at number two on the Billboard 200 and rose to number one in its second week. The only other artists to achieve this feat are Mary J. Blige and Michael Jackson. The album is currently certified two times platinum for sales of over two million copies. 
In Australia, the album debuted at number one on the album charts, with Buble selling over 37,000 copies in the first week, giving him the highest sales for an album by an international artist in Australia for 2007. The album was the best-selling album of 2007 in Australia and sold over 300,000 copies in the UK. Despite being head over heels in love with Emily Blunt, it seemed that past loves and relationships were still a massive influence in Michael Bublé's music. This was evident in the song Lost, which was the second single from the album Call Me Irresponsible. Can't believe it's over I'll watch the whole thing fall And I never saw the writing that was on the wall Michael Bublé has stated that the single Lost was inspired by his breakup with long-term girlfriend Debbie Timmis. In promotion of the single, Bublé performed the song on the UK's X Factor on December 8, 2007. And we can fly, fly, fly. The song was moderately successful worldwide. In Bublé's home country Canada, the single peaked at number 25 in the charts, while in the US, Lost peaked at 97, making it Michael's third highest entrance in the chart. The music video for Lost was directed by Andrew McNaughton and features Michael Bublé listening through the walls of an apartment and hearing the people behind those walls. The music video has gone on to receive over 12 million views on YouTube and was received positively by music critics. I said, baby, you're not lost. Ooh, yeah, yeah. I said, baby, you're not lost. Despite dedicating his song Everything to Emily Blunt, in July of 2008, the news broke that Michael and Emily had split up. Michael and Emily, by all accounts, did not have a great breakup. Uh, if you'll notice, they've never really been seen together since or commented on each other. There were lots of rumors at the time about what had happened, but all that I can say really is, you know, Michael was becoming a huge international star and he was touring an awful lot. At the same time, Emily, was becoming a very successful actress. In fact, she took Michael with her to the premiere of The Devil Wears Prada, which was one of her first mainstream uh, films in the United States and around the world. So, you know, I think that their individual fame came at the same time. It was kind of pulling them in different directions. It wasn't meant to be. I mean, Michael's family and friends all thought that they were the real deal, that Emily would become Mrs. Buble. And I was convinced as well. I remember seeing them at a party and thinking they were really loved up. And he loved talking about her in interviews as well. But as we now know, it wasn't meant to be. And they both met somebody else. The failed romance didn't keep the musician from achieving success. By the summer of 2008, Michael Bublé had sold more than 18 million albums worldwide and had cemented himself as a global superstar. He was also sweeping music award ceremonies all over the world, earning a Grammy and two further Grammy nominations in the US, one Juno Award and five further Juno Award nominations in Canada a nomination at the Brit Awards, and a nomination for an International ECHO Award. It seemed nothing could hold Michael Bublé back from achieving worldwide success. After ending his relationship with British star Emily Blunt in 2008, Michael Bublé began dating Argentinian actress Luisana Lopalato. 
They met in Buenos Aires after Michael Bublé's record company had thrown a party after one of his shows. It's an interesting story how Michael met his future wife. Um, apparently he was performing in Buenos Aires, he was at a gig and he saw her, as anyone who's ever seen her uh, can imagine, she absolutely stood out. At the time, she didn't speak very much English, so he hired an interpreter, got his interpreter to go up to her and say, you're my future wife, you just don't know it yet. And unbelievably, that's exactly what happened. They are incredibly in love. They are the perfect couple. And he, of course, was besotted with her the instant he saw her and then ultimately met her that night at a party with his grandfather. Michael Buble has always had an eye for the ladies, it must be said. He's romantic, he's very much heterosexual, and I think that he is one of those men who um, came into his own sexiness a little bit later in life. And so he definitely appreciates a beautiful woman and still has that kind of, wow, you're amazing, um, incre incredulity that this woman is attracted to him. It's actually very endearing. He doesn't have the kind of cockiness or arrogance that some pop stars do, in part because it came later in life to him, the success and fame. Um, it came in his 20s. It wasn't something that happened to him as a teenager. He had to work very hard for it. And I think, you know, meeting women like Louisana, who is an absolute stunner, and finding out that she was interested in dating him um, was ex extraordinarily exciting for him. After falling in love with Argentine superstar, Michael Buble was again back in the studio to record his fourth studio album, Crazy Love, which included hit single, Haven't Met You Yet. I know that we can be so amazing And being in your life is gonna change me And now I can see every single possibility The 2009 album featured the song Just Haven't Met You Yet, which he actually premiered on The Oprah Winfrey Show, uh, which was, of course, you know, instantly adored by everyone. Now, that song was absolutely inspired by his wife, Luisana, who really he fell in love with before he even spoke to her. And someday I know it'll all turn out And I'll work to work it out Promise you, kid, I'll give more than I get, than I get, than I get, than I get. So I think by writing that song about, you know, the promise, the potential of falling in love was very much about her because he saw her and I think he instinctively knew that he wanted to be with her forever, but he hadn't actually met her yet. And it's a beautiful imagery. In fact, Louisanne is actually in the music video, which is kind of a culmination of the fact that the song is really about her. The video was incredibly clever. It was Michael basically singing, walking around a supermarket, chucking food off the shelves, looking a bit love lost. But there was this beautiful, beautiful woman and she made the video, frankly, for me. She looked stunning. There was obvious chemistry. And look what's happened. Anything can happen in a supermarket. I just haven't met you yet. The single proved to be hugely successful, reaching number one in the U.S. charts. It's Buble's third number one single on the adult contemporary charts after Home and Everything. It was also successful on the Billboard Hot 100, peaking at number 24. The song entered the U.K. singles charts, peaking at number five, making it Buble's first top ten hit in the U.K. The song won the Single of the Year Award at the 2010 Juno Awards and was nominated for Best Male Pop Vocal Performance at the 53rd Grammy Awards. This was the number one album across all genre. This was an extraordinary accomplishment because what this said was, 
Michael Bublé had really turned the world on to his style of music, his voice, and, and the kind of songs that he likes to sing. You know, this at the beginning, when people couldn't understand the concept of what he wanted to do and said that there was no place for this kind of jazz in mainstream music, were 100% proven wrong. Um, in fact, not only was the album so successful, the first night of his tour, he played in Dublin at a stadium that holds nearly 60,000 people and it was sold out. It was the biggest audience he'd ever had to date. So, you know, that year was a pivotal year for him. At this point in his career, Michael Buble was accustomed to experiencing huge success with his singles, but Haven't Met You Yet raised the bar and is often noted as his signature song. The Crazy Love album was recorded over a period of six months in LA, New York, and Vancouver. Michael Bublé has described the album as the ultimate record about the inevitable roller coaster ride of relationships. The album went on to win Album of the Year at the 2010 Juno Awards and was met with positive reviews from the critics. Upon releasing the album, Bublé embarked on a huge promotional tour. Bublé made an appearance on The Oprah Winfrey Show, where he was interviewed by Oprah and performed Haven't Met You Yet. Bublé then went on to a series of press and television appearances in Europe, including Italy, Germany, France, and the UK. The Canadian superstar made an appearance on the UK's X Factor, followed by a performance of Crimea River in front of none other than Queen Elizabeth and her husband, Prince Philip. In 2009, Michael performed in front of the Queen and Prince Philip at the Royal Variety. Now, this was an extraordinary moment for him. I mean, bear in mind, being Canadian, this was his Queen too. I mean, he grew up seeing her image and her face, and they would come and do their royal visits. And I think that it was, in some ways, one of his professional pinnacles of his career. To be on that stage, performing for that kind of audience, was an extraordinary accomplishment for a guy that was ready to give it all up at the age of 25. 2011 was to be an extremely happy year for Michael Bublé. Following the huge success of his fourth studio album, Crazy Love, it was announced that Michael Bublé and Luazana Lobalata were getting married. Well, in 2011, Michael Bublé was officially taken off the market when he married the very beautiful and lovely Luisana Lopilato. It's now Luisana Bublé in any case, and they had an extraordinary wedding in Buenos Aires. It was covered by, you know, mass media around the world, particularly in her country, where she's something of a very a famous model, certainly at this point, in any case. So um, Michael and Luisana were really the golden couple of Buenos Aires, and they had an extraordinarily beautiful day with the two of them and several magazines. Um, but I think what was so interesting about it was, what was so beautiful about it was, is that Michael's an incurable romantic who, when he falls in love, he falls in love big. And he'd finally found the one that he'd been, you know, singing about and looking for for more than a decade. After years of Michael being accused of being a bit of a philanderer, a bit of a playboy, loving the ladies, he settled down, he's found the one. And I also love the fact that she loves appearing in his music videos. After one of the most talked about celebrity marriages of the year, Michael Bublé began work on his next album, Christmas. Being such a huge admirer of Bing Crosby's White Christmas, it was almost inevitable that Bublé would one day release a Christmas album of his own. Now, considering the influence that Bing Crosby had on his own musical career, which, you know, he was singing Bing, Bing Crosby when his parents realized what a talent he was, it was only a matter of time that he was going to release his own Christmas album. That was something that was always in the cards for him. You know, it really did connote those kind of um, Christmas albums that, that everybody likes to hear. You know, Christmas is a time when people go back to tradition, they go back to the crooners, they go back to kind of, um, family music, everybody's together, and Michael's sound fit perfectly with that time of year. The album was released in October 2011 and rose to number one on the Billboard 200 album sales chart, 
becoming Buble's third chart topper following 2007's Call Me Irresponsible and 2009's Crazy Love, and spent a total of five weeks at number one. The album also won a Juno Award for the Album of the Year, making it the first holiday album to win the award. The Christmas album went on to sell 141,000 copies in its first week, going on to sell a further 450,000 copies in the album's third week of release, which marked Buble's best sales week ever. Over the course of 2011, the album sold 2.5 million copies in the U.S. and was the second best-selling album of the year. In Buble's beloved Canada, the album debuted at number two on the Canadian Albums Chart. The album was hugely popular in the UK and peaked at number one on the UK Album Charts. It sold 1.3 million copies in the UK in 2011, making it the UK's second best-selling album of 2011. After bringing festive joy to his fans all around the world, Michael Bublé was back in the studio recording his sixth studio album, To Be Loved. The album included the amazing single, It's a Beautiful Day. I don't know why you think that you could help me when you couldn't get by by yourself. It's a Beautiful Day was released as a lead single from the album To Be Loved on February 25th, 2013. The single peaked at number 10 in the UK singles chart. The song was a top 10 hit throughout most of Europe, managing to peak at number 5 in the charts in Belgium, Finland and Japan. In April 2013, Michael released his album To Be Loved, which was hugely well received by critics and fans alike. It shot straight to number one on the Billboard charts. Um, at the time, his wife, Louisana, was pregnant with their son. And as you can imagine, the song is the album and the songs are very positive, uplifting, happy songs. In fact, the track It's a Beautiful Day was kind of the hit track on that album and kind of sums up where Michael's heart was while he was making that. It was in a really good place. He found the love of his life. They were expecting a son. It's a beautiful day and I can't stop myself from smiling. If I drink and then I'm by And I know there's no denying. And it's just a very, um, positive kind of reflection of how happy Michael is at present. It's a beautiful day. To Be Love was commissioned by Michael's record label after the huge success of his Christmas album. The album was produced by Bob Rock and was recorded in Vancouver and LA. The album features backing vocals by Hollywood A-lister Reese Witherspoon on the album's track, Something Stupid. Being able to attract such big names to feature on his album was testament to how hugely popular Michael Bublé has become since his big break. The album received many positive reviews from music critics. All Music's Matt Collar stated that the album isn't just a perfect showcase of Bublé's voice, it's also one of his most diverse and enjoyable albums. James Baldwin from the Canberra Times said that Michael's voice seems to be getting better and better with each release. Bublé's sixth studio album, To Be Loved, was hugely popular amongst fans and music critics. And in June of 2013, Michael embarked on the To Be Loved World Tour, which began at the O2 Arena in London. Well, winning the genetic lottery is Noah Buble, who was born in August 2013. Now, this is a beautiful little boy with two incredibly, extraordinarily attractive parents who completely dote on him. They released a photo early on of the, of the family, and he's a 
absolutely darling little boy. And it'll be interesting to see, I think, how this affects Michael's next album. Because, you know, all the way through, Michael Buble is someone who writes about what's going on in his heart. And he has fallen in love deeply in the past, and his songs have reflected that. And I think what we're seeing now is a very hopeful, positive, happy guy, which is coming through in the lyrics and the songs he's creating. It will be interesting to see how being a father affects the tone, the sound, and the lyrics of what he writes in the future. One of Michael Bublé's most endearing features is his love for his fans. In a time when many celebrities will cover up and do whatever it takes to stay anonymous from a crowd of fans, Michael Bublé embraces it. Michael Bublé loves his fans. I mean, I haven't seen any other artists connect so well with his audience in years, if I don't think ever in my lifetime. Go and see Michael Bublé live on stage and he spends the majority of the concert talking to his fans. He'll exchange camera messages, photo text messages. He'll pose for photos with his fans. He'll bring people on stage. He reads the banners. He even walks into the audience when he's performing. I mean, he really loves his fans. He appreciates the fact that they've made him what he is today and he loves to give back. He's a bit cheeky with it too. And let's be honest, most of the women in the audience want to marry him. But that's the charm, that's the appeal of Michael Bublé, and he loves it. One thing that sets Michael Bublé apart, and also I think bodes well for his future, is the uh, respect and gratitude that he has for his fans. Um, you know, Michael is one of the best celebrities that I can think of in terms of making time for fans, acknowledging fans, recognizing fans, thanking fans. He's one of the only artists I know who will stop a concert uh, midway through to greet people in the front row, to shake people's hands, to touch people on a rope line. He'll even ask reporters, you know, to stop a series of questions if he recognizes a fan standing near to them. No, I haven't. I, I have a friend that I just, I saw back there, Gina. Hi, sweetie pie, how are you? So good, oh my God. Thank you so much for that beautiful gift you gave us. I loved it. Yes, thank you. So I have it up. What was the gift? She got me a, be a, a, a beautiful bowl for our, our apartment and a nice uh, a picture of me and my whole band. It's like the only shot I've ever had of my me and my whole band. So. He's someone who knows how hard it was to get where he is. He's never stopped being grateful for those who have helped him get there. Throughout his amazing career, Michael Bublé has pledged many donations and been involved with charities all around the world. Charities such as the Robert F. Kennedy Memorial, 21st Century Leaders, and Habitat for Humanity. The fact that Bublé has put so much time and money into charities is a trait that has earned him respect all around the world. The key to understanding Michael Bublé is to understand his background. He is a family man. He loves his family and his life back in Vancouver with his Italian sort of heritage as well. It's given him a real sort of strength and core as a family man. And of course, he's just become a dad as well. So he has always been that person, but he's also always been somebody who gives back to his fans and gives back to charities. He supports over 12 different charities. He supports over 12 different charitable causes. He once gave $50,000 to the victims of the bushfires in Australia. And in fact, once in the northeast of England, he even gave thousands of pounds to a community arts project that hired a Michael Bublé tribute act to sing at their concert. When he found out there was a fake Michael Bublé going to perform, he gave them 5,000 pounds to make up the difference to help children in the local community. So he's always been somebody that gives back and believes in helping in some very important causes. There is no doubt that Michael Bublé is one of the biggest stars in the world today. He has sold out arenas all around the world and has captured the hearts of fans with his endearing personality and his unique voice. Having achieved so much already in his career, what does the future hold for Michael Bublé? Michael's all about the voice. He's not about how he looks or how he dresses. So there's no reason his voice can't last him into the 60s or 70s. So in terms of longevity, uh, he's got it all, you know, going for him and I think there's absolutely no reason he won't be around for a very long time to come, making fantastic new music, selling millions of records on a global scale and just being an inspiration and an icon for millions. I think Michael Bublé has been incredibly successful over the last seven, eight years. 
because he knows there is value in the quality of a song and the quality of a voice. He's been very clever in fusing pop with jazz and basically delivering some classic songs to a whole new generation. He grew up with a grandfather who played in Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, the Mills Brothers records. He fell in love with that era and that sound. Even though he was born in 1975 and should have been listening to Madonna and Michael Jackson, he was loving Sammy Davis Jr. He loved Dean Martin. So here we are in the 21st century when the world has fallen in love with Michael Bublé and his persona and the charisma, but also the fact that the man can sing. Michael Bublé has such an assured future, actually. He's almost in one of the most perfect positions in the music industry, where his success, even though he is very good looking, he does have all of these female fans and they definitely buy into him as a bit of a sex symbol and all of that sort of thing. But his success and his future success is absolutely not reliant on that in any way because fundamentally people buy into Michael Bublé for his voice. And it's the sort of voice that is only going to develop and mature over the years. He's actually still incredibly young, really, comparatively. So I actually could see him having a career along the lines of someone like Sir Tom Jones. You know, I think you could potentially see him in decades to come still selling out arenas around the world, still having a very, very successful music career. And I think the other thing that's important to note about him is that he's one of the few modern day artists who has not been about singles, having hit singles. For him, it's all about the album market. His albums are incredibly successful. And that, I think, is probably something that's slightly liberating because it's very hard these days to release a single that's going to be a big hit and get played on radio stations around the world. But he has such a massive inbuilt fan base now who buy his albums because they just want to hear his voice. So I think he's in a really, really strong position actually going forward and I don't think there'd be any question marks about whether he was going to be a successful recording artist in 10 years' time, 20 years' time, even 30 years' time. Well, I think the future is certainly bright for Michael Bublé. He has really earned, through his own hard work, determination, and I think refusal to give up, he has really earned a place at the table, I think, internationally, in terms of fame. You know, a lot of people have talent, and a lot of people have ability, but not everyone has the drive and determination that Michael's had. He has persevered when people told him the genre wouldn't work or he was already 25 and too old to kind of expect to still be famous. And, you know, he packed up and moved to Los Angeles just based on a promise from a music producer that he would maybe produce his album, even though Michael had to raise the money himself. He has worked very hard to get where he is and he very much so deserves it.